Well, good morning. I'm missing a couple people up here, but that's probably okay. Uh, welcome to church. Today is a beautiful day outside. It's not too hot, not too cold, and it's not raining. We, we've been watching our, our friends in Colorado are all posting pictures on Facebook of the five inches of snow they got yesterday. In the middle of May, yeah, five inches in the morning and no trace of it by the time the afternoon came around. And so uh, uh, today's a good day to go out to the park or do whatever, you know, but uh, um, we're starting the day off right. If, if you would, let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have to come to your house, Lord, to worship you. God, to come here and, and in humility, Lord, leaving behind the, the garbage that we tend to drag around with us everywhere, Lord. God, that we would come in here, that we would sing to you, we would lift your name, we would help to sharpen each other, Lord, glorifying you in all that we do. Father, we're here because we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers and our praises today and help us to grow closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. To grab your hymnals and open up to 444. And we're going to do, uh, we're going to skip verse 4 on this one, if that's okay. <laughs> Wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way, since the Savior found me. If you're able, let's stand and sing together, starting with verse 2. No clouds may gather in the Other sky and hills round me roll. However dark the world may be, I've sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me. Five. And I shall see him as he is the light that came to me, and with the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight. morning. Uh, today in the nursery is Paris and Ruth. Uh, next week's Robin. Uh, we will have Sunday evening service tonight over in the education building. Uh, come out for song, prayer, and a discussion on our daily uh, reading of the Old Testament. Our next uh, community dinner will be June 6th. To help or donate, talk to Kathy. Uh, invite your friends and neighbors. Uh, VBS is coming up soon. If you would like to help out, uh, see Jeannie Brower or Kathy Shaver. It'll be held the July 11th through the 15th. And then there'll be a pre-registration party on the 9th, which 
they've got a lot of neat stuff coming. It's like a bouncy house, and if you want your face painted, uh, design a T-shirt. And I heard there's going to be a barbecue. Is this correct? Yes. Pardon me? So come on out for that. It ought to be fun. Uh, youth camp's coming up. <coughs> uh, okay, that'll be held the May 31st through the 3rd. For details, contact Mandy. Uh, the registration has already been turned in, but we really need to be in prayer for that group as it starts, what, a week from tomorrow? Okay, so... We need to be in prayer for the youth and the adults that are going to that. And then children's camp is also on the horizon, and that'll be July 18th to the 22nd over at Grand Oaks for children who have completed third through sixth grade. Uh, if you're interested in attending as a camper or a volunteer, uh, see either me or Cheryl. We have the forms in the superintendent's office. Uh, the nursing home had their first ministry over at Lock Haven Thursday at 2, and they'll be doing this every first and third Thursday of the, every month. And they do hymns, prayers, and a message, plus some time to visit and love on the residents. If you're interested in being involved in this, see Rob. Uh, Everything seemed to go well, and they had a great, it was a great outreach. Uh, the 150-year birthday party for the church will be held June 26th. And then join us in, for prayer on Thursday at 11 over in the multipurpose building. And then today is Disaster Relief Appreciation Day, and we have three or four or five guys and gals that are involved in that, and if you see them, congratulate them, and I'd like to give them a hand. And I guess they're getting ready pretty quick to go to Oklahoma, so keep them in their prayers. Also, the Compton family and Kathy Shaver have COVID, so keep them in your prayers. And I understand Joe is over at Samaritan. She fell. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. And she fell and is over there. And then also I heard Freddie is doing better. You can have 15 seconds. Go.
and thank you. Now, even, even if you do get 100%, doesn't mean we're going to give you another 15 seconds. So. <laughs> ah, yeah, Bloodmobile is going to be here Tuesday, right? It's going to be here Tuesday from 1 to 5.30? 1.30 to 5.30. Come out and give blood. Um, they'll be in the multi-purpose room. So... All right, uh, if you would, grab those hymnals again and open up to 184. Jesus is all the world to me. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of Light of the world by dawn. 
as he stands in victory. Sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of John 2 verses 12 through 14. I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. He's open to number 448.
Heavenly Father, God, that's all we ask for. God, is the opportunity to be closer to you day by day, minute by minute. God, it's what we strive for. It's what we're studying right now in your word, Lord, is how we can grow our relationship, how we can be closer to you, how we can be more like you. Lord, and we know that it begins with this daily walk. Lord, that can always be closer than it is. God, we pray as we continue worshiping, Lord, that you would be glorified today. Lord, and as we move on to our tithes and offerings, God, I pray that this would be something more than what it's become in a lot of places, Lord, that this isn't just giving up money, giving up uh, resources because we feel like we have to, Lord, but because we're doing this out of worship, Lord. We recognize that everything good that we have comes from you. Lord, and it's a privilege for us to be able to give back to your work. God, we pray that uh, as we do so, Lord, that you would continue to bless us, continue to provide for us, Lord. But most of all, Lord, that we would continue to have the opportunity to come here and worship you in the way that we are now. Father, we love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Have the ushers come forward, please. I want to mention something about this song we're about to do. You're probably not going to know it. Um, I, I sang it last Sunday night. Uh, Kaylin and I did uh, at the graduation dinner. She just introduced this song to me last week, and I've been singing it pretty much nonstop. We sang it at uh, Lock Haven as well. So if you don't know it, uh, read the words and listen, and just uh, um, you're going to start hearing it a lot, I think. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love and deep and boundless this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley. Jesus bled and suffered 
for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I own my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the change are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus All I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. then to Germany, then back to Colorado, then back to Hannibal. <laughs> well, you can see why that song's been sticking with me all week. But uh, for right now, uh, we're going to do something that is a part of the, the identity of our church. And that is we're going to spend some time in prayer together, uh, separately together. Um, you've heard from Mike and uh, from uh, from Irene and from Freddie and all that there's there are definitely things and people to be praying for in our body and so we're going to take a few minutes now we're going to pray silently to ourselves whatever the Lord has placed on your heart if you'd like to come forward and pray at the altar we'll invite you to do so uh, but in a couple of minutes I'll bring us back together
Father God, you are an awesome God. Lord, we see it day in and day out with the wonders of your creation, Lord, but even more so in situations like we've shared with today, Lord, where we see your hand on the life of somebody that we care about, Lord, and you bring healing. Lord, and we know this happens every day across this world, Lord, and we do not stop and recognize how wonderful you are enough. God, in fact, the things that we're able to do as we just sang, Lord, the amazing things that we are capable of doing in this world, Lord, it is yet not I, but through you and me. God, I pray that you would help us to recognize that more often. Lord, we thank you for letting us into your house. Lord, for letting us come in as we are and bring our troubles to you. Lord, when we should be spending every moment praising you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, you let us come in and you let us gripe and complain and talk about how things aren't fair. But God, you are gracious and you are faithful to us. Lord, and I pray that we would never forget that even as we continue to lift each other up in prayer, as we continue to encourage each other and continue to try and point people toward you. Father, we pray that as we look at your word today, that you'd help us to take that next step to grow closer to you in our, in our daily lives. Lord, that we might uh, be that much more effective, God, at reflecting you to the world around us. Father, we love you. We're here, Lord, to glorify you. In your name we pray, amen. Now, there is a common tool that is used in TVs and movies that reflects something that I think to a degree actually happens, okay? There are times where a character, usually a main character who has lost somebody very close to them, a mentor or a family member or somebody that, that they were very close to and depended upon, they've lost them and they'll speak to this person like they're a vision or a ghost or something that's still with them, okay? You see it in the Star Wars movies when Luke talks to Obi-Wan. You know, it's like his mentor is still there, almost acting like a conscience and a guide, telling him how, how to do things the right way. Sometimes they're like a conscience, but sometimes it can be like the opposite. You know, somebody who, who, you know, is maybe trying to get him to go down the wrong path. But in either case, that memory or that specter or whatever it is has some kind of influence over the character's life. All right, they listen to it. They, want, they, 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 they think they see maybe some wisdom in what it's saying. And I say that I think this happens in life at least to a degree. I don't think that little ghosts appear on people's shoulders or anything like that. But one of the things that we say to people who have lost someone close to them is that that person is always with you in your heart. They're always there. They're always there in your memory. And I believe that it's especially true if this person played a role in your personal development, if it's a parent or a sibling or a grandparent or somebody that helped you to develop into the person that you've become, somebody that has spoken truth into your life before, you're going to remember that truth and it's like it's being spoken to you again in the moment when you need to hear it. We remember those things when we make decisions. And in a way, we carry these people with us long after we're, they're gone. Sometimes we do this consciously. We specifically think about how they might react in a given situation. Or at least uh, how they would counsel me to react in this situation. But sometimes it's subconscious. Sometimes it's only later on when you look back and you go, I did that exactly the way my dad would have done it. And I didn't even realize while I was doing it, you know. Now in everyday life, we choose a lot of the people that we spend our time with. It's not always the case. For much of my life, I worked in close proximity with people that I probably would not have spent time with otherwise. Uh, but in my leisure time, I hang around with people that I get along with, people that I relate to, people that I want to, you know, hang around with. That's generally what we do as people. The people we surround ourselves with will have a fairly significant impact on our lives, especially the more time we spend together. When you're hanging around somebody all the time, you start to pick up their characteristics as they start to pick up yours. It's kind of amazing how that happens. And for those of you who have kids, 
whether they're grown up or uh, with their own little kids or your own little kids yourself, they have all had that friend or that group of friends that's just plain no good. And you know it from the minute you see him, that kid is no good. They're obviously no good, and you don't want your kids around them. And, and yes, you could forbid your kids from hanging around with, with that kid or being friends with them, but, but while they're at school and such, they're still going to be around. These people, the, the dreaded bad influence, all right, on your child, this person who has the ability to take the perfect little human being that is your angelic t- child and turn them into one of those stinking kids. All right, and the truth is, when we're around a certain type of behavior, we're going to subconsciously mimic that behavior All right, to fit in with a social situation. We don't want to stick out. We want to, we want to gel, you know? And so if I hang around people who use a, foul language, use a lot of foul language, there's a good chance I'm going to get looser with my own language because that's how everybody's talking. This is similar to what we discussed two weeks ago, that whole idea of garbage in, garbage out. All right, it's the same thing with who you spend your time with. They can have a huge bearing on who we are, even when they're not there with us. And so today I'm going to talk about the fourth and and final aspect of unity in Christ that we're going to talk about. And that's that we've talked about our choice to abide, to live in Christ, and our acceptance of Christ in us. Right, and then last week we talked about... uh, uh, what it's like, our desire to be like Christ, to mimic him, to imitate Christ in the things that we do. Now we're going to talk about the essence of the relationship itself, to be with Christ, what it means to be with him, to take time to spend with him. This is our fellowship with him. It's the core of our relationship. All right, it's, it's us putting him foremost in our lives and following his timeline. And it begins with intentional and specific time between you and God, and nothing else at all, all right? I'm going to hit you with a bunch of verses that describe this, uh, that this, our call to be in fellowship with God. So they're up there, uh, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with all of them kind of at once. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Matthew 28, 20, And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And now since we know that Jesus' body had ascended to heaven and he was not physically there anymore, we see that these verses are talking more about his divine nature. All right, just like we talked about when somebody you love leaves, you carry them with them. Jesus was saying, I'm still with you. Of course, he was talking more in a more real way because he sent the spirit to be his advocate. But he said, I'm with you till the end of time. You are never alone. All right, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. All right, we know him. Philippians 3, 8 through 10 says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. We're comforted by him. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 through 17 says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. We're taught by him. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And we live our whole lives in his presence. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. All right, and in fact, 1 Corinthians 1 9 tells us exactly what it means to be a follower of Christ. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowship. 
It's all about spending time with God intentionally. That's what a relationship is. You can't have a relationship if you don't spend time with the person. All right. The fellowship with him is what makes us who we are. And it's the biggest part of what made the difference between the New Testament church and the Israelites who were in the desert. All right, this was the huge difference. Rather than this strict legal binding around us, we're actually invited into a true relationship with Christ. Something that had to be bought at the price of Jesus' life for our sins. Something that the Israelites didn't have. They followed rules. That was how they uh, abided in Christ. They kept the law. They did their best to, to step right and, and do the right sacrifices and attend the right festivals. Us, we have direct access to spend time with Christ. We know that this relationship and fellowship with God is going to vary in intensity throughout our lives. One of the things I asked as a Christianese question when we first started this, I asked, uh, you remember this, uh, uh, how's your walk with God? Sometimes our walk with God is just a closer walk with thee, like we sang. And sometimes... I don't want anything to do with talking to God about anything that's going on with me because I've got it handled. Thank you very much. It's going gonna, it's gonna to vary throughout our lives, usually depending upon our circumstances. And what's amazing to me is usually when times are good and are easy, I think these are the times that it's even easier for us to slip away from being close to God because we feel like we've got everything handled. It's when there's struggle, but there's that, that kind of that happy medium. When there's too much struggle, then we want to blame God. We have to have the appropriate amount of struggle. Then we know we're in the right place, right? In each of Paul's letters, he delivers a benediction at the end, a challenge to the readers that is something akin to the Lord be with you all. It shows that there is always hope for a deeper relationship and closer fellowship with God. This is how he closed every letter. You and God together. That's what this is all about. It's actually a very interesting term, the word with. All right, because we use it in all kinds of contexts to mean all manner of things. We use it to describe our approach to something. We do it with pride or with caution. We use it to describe what we mean with all due respect. We use it to describe our own abilities with greatness or with ineptitude. We use it to describe our company with me or with you or with them. We use it to describe our understanding. Are you with me? It's almost as though we use this word with to better explain who we are because it's what we use to describe the tools that we employ on a regular basis. Maybe you dance with grace or you speak with authority or you lead with confidence. But sometimes we go the other way. We say, well, this happens without fail. And this can be believed without a doubt. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to Hebrews chapter 12. Boy, I put that verse up there wrong, didn't I? It's hard to go 22 to 14. So it'll be a surprise. <laughs> now, sometimes the term without is actually easier for us to understand than with. Because to be without something is to notice a piece missing, to see a gap. Something's not quite connecting when we're without. Being without something or someone is almost always viewed in a negative light. Because we look at it as, as the loss of something or the absence of something that we need. All right, but at the same time, we could say that Freddie being without cancer, that's not a negative thing. Right, but we don't usually look at it that way. We seem to understand the negative of being without God may be better than what it means to be with him. In fact, we sing a hymn on Sunday nights that makes this clear to us and, and see if you uh, recognize these words. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Then the second verse really hammers the point home and gets really dark. Without him, I could be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. 
but with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. And in the last line, Jesus, oh Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. And we sing this song and we believe what it says and we recognize that without Jesus, we are in a sorry state. But why is it so difficult to understand then how we should live with him? The opposite of what we're singing about there, being without him. It's hard to know. If being without him is darkness and being with him brings light, shouldn't that be our entire priority, is being with him? And is it your priority? I wish I could say it always is mine. How can we be with him if he's in heaven and we're here? Now, the author of Hebrews speaks about the act of gathering in worship to praise God. And this is in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And I'm on the wrong page. Starting in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. And you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This participation that we do here every Sunday is a participation in heavenly worship. All right, as we sit here and we sing, the Bible says that the angels are joining with us and singing with us as we worship the Father. And this participation in that worship is what the early church spoke of in the Apostles' Creed as the communion of the saints. When we worship, the heavenly host worships with us and it allows us to rejoice in knowing that our praise is being heard in heaven and that God is with us when we're worshiping him. He's here. We are with him when we're praising him. So we're with him when we worship. Consider the meaning of that. Now, many of you guys have heard me state many times that worship is the meaning of life. It is the reason we're here, the reason we exist, is to glorify God. All right? That's what we're here for. We're created to glorify God as humans, and as a church, our purpose as a church is to worship God. And through healthy worship, everything else comes out. Healthy evangelism, healthy missions, healthy, uh, healthy service, healthy everything comes out of a core of healthy worship. That's what our purpose is. Worship is the center. It's what matters most because God is what matters most, no matter what the situation is. And if we're worshiping God, he is with us. Our job is to live lives of worship, to be always in his presence. Everything we do, we're supposed to be doing as unto God, as an act of worship to him, which means he is with us always. That's what it means to be with him. 1 John 1.3 tells us that, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, as we pray and bring our lives to him, what this verse tells us is that he hears us and we have fellowship with him when we're praying. To fellowship with Jesus, we talk to him and we worship him. We get to know him. When you fellowship with each other, you chat. You find out about each other's lives. You ask how they're doing. All right, we talk about prayer requests within the church because we know each other. We care about each other. We're concerned about each other. And we want to know that people are getting better, that people are growing in their relationship with Christ, and that people are living the best life that they can in Christ. We talk. We get to know. And these are things that are very accessible to us. They're easy for us to accomplish and they allow us to be with God in his presence, talking to him and worshiping him. And yet, as easy as they are to do, in many cases, they'll be the first thing that we'll drop in our day because of time. To be with Christ will cost us time and attention. And in today's society, there seems to be nothing more valuable than our time and attention. It's the currency of life. And if we're to live with Christ, there are really two types of actions that we need to be thinking about. What it means to be with Christ. 
when we look at how we spend our time. We have times that are active in our relationship with him. Active times uh, where we're spending time devoted specifically to him. You know, the time that we spend in worship, like we have the time where we're here and we're listening to the word, the time that we spend at home in prayer. These are active times where we're saying, this is my time with God and with nothing else. But then there's also the passive things. All right. Passive time is the time that we spend living life and meeting responsibilities and everything else that we do all day long. Notice the relational words are active and passive and never absent. We don't have absent time with God. You are either communicating with him actively or passively at all times because he is always there. If we are living with Christ, there's a degree of togetherness in, with him in all parts of our lives, whether we're dedicating it to him or we're doing other things. This is what it means to live a life of worship. All things unto Christ, even the everyday and the mundane. Now next week, we're going to focus on the active time with God. And some of the things that, the practices that any mature Christian should be practicing on a regular basis to maintain their relationship with Christ. And the reason why I want to focus on that, the subject is called spiritual formation. And I took a class in seminary about spiritual formation and I realized that nobody ever taught me this. Nobody ever said, this is how you mature in your relationship with God. These are the things you could do. They said, here's a Bible, read it, pray. And then I just kind of figured it out as I went. And that tends to be what we do. But you know what? There are things you can do to enrich your relationship with God. And we're going to talk about some of these disciplines. All right, if you've heard people talk about prayer and fasting, uh, you'll hear words like liturgy or uh, what was the other word? I, I, it's uh, Lectio Divina, which is spiritual reading. Yeah, I'm not allowed to use bigger words. Freddie told me I can't use my $10 seminary words. But next week, we're going to talk about some of these things that we can do that help us grow closer to the Creator. But today, I want you to consider what life with Christ is like during the everyday tasks of living in rural Missouri and what that's supposed to look like. All right. We know that if we choose to uh, live in Christ and Him in us, we should be visible to others. All right, if we choose to imitate him, it should be obvious to others because we should be sticking out like a sore thumb because we don't see a lot of people trying to imitate Christ. All right, and when somebody is, you notice. All right, people should be noticing us. That's not what we're after, being noticed, but we're after being an example. People seeing something that they want and, and gravitating toward that. All right, consider for me this question. When you meet a person, what's, what do you notice first about them? Right, just a, a random person on the street. Usually when we meet somebody new, uh, assuming we're actually really paying attention and being fully engaged, which with cell phones these days, we're usually not. But let's just pretend we are. All right, we're being personable. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to size that person up visually. And what we're going to do is we're going to subconsciously tuck away little ideas and assumptions based on what we see, because that's what the brain does. We're going to see things, and it's unfortunate that we start there, but it's really a fact of life. Our lives and our experiences have created biases. So we're going to see something, and it's going to connect to something in our past, positive or, or negative, and we're going to file that away. All right. And it's going to happen in a split second before you even have a chance to consciously think about what you're thinking. All right. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Our lives have created these biases and some of them are unhealthy, but some of them are just the natural course of things. It's a natural defense mechanism. We see something that says danger. It automatically has us react in danger. You know, it's, it's the way we're made. If I see or meet somebody who has a visible pistol, who's not a police officer, that's going to affect my initial approach to them. Because I'm going to see that and I'm going to be like, that could be bad. All right. If I see somebody on crutches, the first thing in my mind is, why are you on crutches? I'm not going to walk up and say, hi, I'm Rob. Why are you on crutches? 
you know, but that's what my brain's going to think because it's not exactly what I expect in the normal course of every day. All right? It's the result of having an inquiring mind. It's not meant to be insulting. It's just where our mind goes. So what are the kinds of things that we notice? We notice distinguishing characteristics, right? For instance, if somebody is extremely attractive looking, or on the other side, extremely unattractive looking, all right? And whether we want to or not, that impression is going to impact our words and our voice inflection as we talk to them. Maybe in a way that's not noticeable, especially if you're well-trained in that sort of thing, but, but you almost can't help it. We notice things that are abnormal, abnormally good or abnormally bad, or just abnormally different from what we're used to. If someone has two different colored eyes, you're going to notice that, all right? If they have an abundance of piercings, we're going to notice that. Or wildly dyed hair, you're going to notice it. We take in anything that makes them different from me. Right? Because me is the norm in my brain. And so if you're not like me, then everything that's not like me is not the norm. And that's what I'm going to notice. And it happens in the blink of an eye. Now, a large percentage of what a person sees in me is out of my control, for the most part. All right? I can't control my looks apart from how I array myself. I mean, I can lose weight. I can focus on my appearance and try and swing the attractiveness meter in my favor. All right? And we all do it. Everybody does. It's why you comb your hair in the morning. It's why you put on clothes that match most of you. And <laughs> we like to make a good impression because we like to be liked. Right? Who doesn't want to be liked? And this is where it becomes important to control those things that we can control. All right, when you stop caring and, you know, it's I just give up, that's when things start going downhill. Now, after your first impression of someone, eventually they're likely going to speak and you're going to get a whole new rush of information. All right, and many times in my past, I have met a, an attractive looking person of the opposite sex only to hear them speak in such a vile manner I can't even recognize what was attractive about them in the beginning. Right, we're just immediately, it's like, wow, goodbye. You know? The fact is that first impressions are important and they do last, but the impression that's really going to stick to you comes from the person that you choose to present yourself to be. All right? Unfortunately, in life, sometimes people won't let you get to that second impression. But once you do, that's the one you're going to have a hard time overcoming later on. How you behave will always impact my perception of you more than how you look. And I don't say that because I'm deeper or less shallow than the average person. It's just studies have shown that degrees of attractiveness will rise and fall more through conversation than they do through visual stimulation. All right. People are attracted to how people look, but they're attracted to the person that's inside too. It's just not as visceral and not as immediate, you know? It's something that you come to learn. I think all of us wish that we could probably be better looking in one way or another. And the truth of it is that many of the flaws that we see in ourselves, other people don't even notice them. All right, but it's all you see when you look in the mirror. Like me, my, my truck, I love my truck. But the hood's been replaced on my truck because of hail. And the silver on that hood is not quite exactly the same color as the rest of the truck. Nobody else can see it. I can't see anything but that when I look at my truck. There's my truck with the dumb, wrong colored hood. That's all I see. All right? And we do the same things to ourselves when we look in the mirror. You see the one thing that gets under your skin and you can't get away from it. And somebody else may not even be aware that it's there. But I want you to consider this question. Rather than how well we attract people to us, how well are we attracting people to what attracts us? Right, because that's the way we need to be thinking about this. And let me break that down. Intimacy with Christ is an all-in or nothing situation. You can't have one foot in and one foot out because you're not going to grow in maturity and intimacy that way. You're either in it or you're not. I mean, we can live lukewarm lives and never live up to our potential or our, 
our calling with him. But where's the joy and satisfaction in that? Where's the the devotion and the gratitude to God who sacrificed his son so that we could live half in and half out? If we want intimacy with Christ, all of these things that we've been discussing for five weeks come into play. It is full, intentional, time-consuming devotion to God over all things. And given what Christ did for us, God ought to demand such devotion from us. But he doesn't, because his grace is sufficient for us. We don't have to do anything except accept him. But how can we accept his grace and his forgiveness and his sacrifice and not pursue a mature and fulfilled relationship with him? How can we really do that? When you open your mouth to speak to someone new, what will they perceive as being number one in your life? It'll be obvious in the words you use and the kindness and respect you show to them and others and the content of your speech and the passion of your heart. I mean, as the song goes that we've sung in here a number of times, they will know we are Christians by our love. Right? Because it's evident. Is that what a stranger sees in you? Do they see love? Do they see devotion? Do they see acceptance? And if not, what needs to change? And how do we do it? The only change that's going to stick begins inside and works its way out. All right, you can't start outside and work your way in. The heart affects the mind and the body, so to affect real change, we begin with the heart. And the love of your life will be its center. All right, is Christ the love of your life? Is your relationship with him the number one thing? And if it's not, what actions are you taking in the active side of devotion in order to make that heart change that will impact the passive side of your relationship with him? How are you going to show people the way Christ has changed you if you haven't allowed him to do so? All right, I'm going to get real with you. I'm putting the the boxing gloves on. This this is going to hurt because it hurt me. Time with Christ is something that you can do. The hours are there. The predominant excuse is always that we don't have time to spend an hour in devotion with God. Yes, you do have the time. You have 24 hours every day. You get 24 of them. And to say that you don't have time for God is to make excuses that allow you to put your own agenda first. And that is not what a child of God does. See, I thought I was going to get an amen out of that one. (laughs) It sounds harsh, but it's a fact. We all have time for him. We all do. Because he is more important than anything else that we could possibly spend our time on. So that excuse is invalid. And when we're struggling to spend time with God, there is usually something else at play. And I can feel it in my own life when I'm having trouble. There is something that's like a physical block keeping me from connecting with God. Sometimes it's because I can't get my mind off of other things. Sometimes it's because when I close my eyes to pray, I can't stay awake. It's any number of things. And when things like that happen, you have to find a way around it. For me, when I couldn't stay awake to pray, I started praying out loud while I was driving. Because I was staying awake then. We always have the ability. But there can be deception in our hearts telling us that we don't have time or that we don't need it or any other host of lies that keep us from pursuing time with him. And the truth is that there is no excuse. The time is there. You just have to allocate it correctly. So I'm going to challenge you. Start spending time with him today. And then... Watch the things around you begin to change as you do that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I know that I need more time with you. Again, we sing another song, more love, more power, more of you in my life. And I have control over that. I'm asking for it. And at the same time, I can devote more of my time to you. And yet I don't, God. And 
I don't understand myself. God, we need to be with you intentionally. We need to grow closer to you to get to know you better, God. And, and unfortunately, we tend to put everything else in this life first. If I've got time for God, then maybe I'll, I'll stay my hour. I'll tick that box. God, and that's not a relationship. That's a religion. God, we want a relationship. As we continue praying with our heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you hear me talking about this relationship and how we grow in it and you don't have a relationship with God, not in the way that we've been talking about. Maybe you've never accepted the free gift of grace and recognized that you're a sinner and asked for forgiveness. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Just pray silently, repeat uh, silently to yourself after me. Say, God, I, I don't have a relationship with you, but I want to have one. Lord, I may not know everything that the, the Bible says, but I, I know that your son died on the cross, and, and as a result, my sins are forgiven, Lord. So I ask that you would forgive my sins. God, that you would become a part of my life. Lord, allow me to have a real and vibrant relationship with you that can grow and mature. Lord, to the point where I can affect others and help them to have a relationship with you as well. And thank you for all that you've done. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. As we continue praying, if you prayed that for the first time, I'm going to ask you to come and find me after this service and give me a chance to pray with you. I'm not going to make you stand up in front of everybody or anything like that. But I want to know that you've made the decision so that we can celebrate together. I'll give you a Bible. We can talk about next steps. And if you're online, it's the same thing there. Find somebody. Come by the church. Go by the parsonage. Give us a call. Go on the website. Reach out to somebody who can help you take the next steps. Father God, the first thing I said when we were praying this morning is that, that you're an awesome God. God, and the more we talk about you, the more we learn about you, the more we realize the, the truth in that statement. God, that no matter what we're dragging behind us, you welcome us home every time. Father, we want to be closer to you. We want to grow in our relationship with you. We want to be authentic. Lord, in the way that we interact with people, we want to point people to you in everything that we do. God, and we're going to fall short of that a lot. But we ask for your help. We ask that you would help us to reprioritize our time and carve out the time that we need to be spending with you. To be conscious of your presence throughout the day as we go about our lives. To constantly lean on you for support. To remind us who we are, Lord, in your eyes. And help us to show others who they are. Father, we love you. The things that you've done for us and continue to do for us, Lord, we, we can't even number. It's beyond measure. Lord, I pray that you would help us to never forget. God, that we would do all we can to spend all of our time with you. Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for being here. Beautiful day outside. Go out. Spend some time with your family. Come back tonight at 6 o'clock for our Sunday night service. Have a fantastic week.